So let's move on to the fourth reading, credit risk transfer mechanisms. It's fairly simple, but it's important. So pay attention. It talks about the type of risk, which is credit risk, uh, the risk of a borrower defaulting, and there's a core risk exposure held by a bank. So bank obviously has a risk that the person that has given a loan to might default. And how does it ensure this risk? There are different instruments. We'll let's study about them quickly. The first is credit defaults. So let's understand this. The bank has given out loan to uh, an entity B, let's say worth 100 million. So what the bank says, it goes bank A, it goes to C and says, I'll give you 2% uh, annually. Uh, and whenever this person defaults, you'll have to give me back the amount. And C agrees, okay, I'll do that. Basically, bank A transfers the risk, just like an insurance, it pays this 2% premium. And if B defaults, C will give A 100 million. Simple. That is CDS. It's just like an insurance. It can be a bond, B's bond that A has taken or a loan, anything. It's pretty simple that way. It's a very direct way to measure and transfer credit risk. And they function like an insurance contract. That's what given. So let's study the advantages. So from a, a buyer of a CDS perspective, it spurs innovation. So A is CDS plus because it is buying the default swap and C is CDS minus. We'll call it that. So since A has taken that insurance, his risk has gone down. So it means it can take more risk. It means in the long run, it can innovate more with the funds it has. Second is cash flow potential from C's perspective. This is talking about that since it's getting a regular stream of cash flows of 2 million here, then it can uh, diversify its business lines uh, to reduce its risk or it can take a CDS or again, like it can take a CDS again from D that it'll, it'll pay D 1% and D will give them 100 million when B defaults. So it has fixed 1%, 1 million cash flow every year. There can be different types and different etc. Or C can uh, take default swaps or give out default swaps to 10 different people. So C is in total getting 20% and usually out of 10, one, it expects only one to default. So in that way, C can diversify its business and reduce its correlation as well. <clears throat> Third one is risk price discovery. So what this 2% does or whatever is that it uh, tells us the credit worthiness of B and A and it gives us a price on that credit risk. That's it, what I said. The disadvantage, however, are that historically weak regulations because these contracts, these insurance contracts were unregulated until after the 2007-9 crisis and there was counterparty risk. What if, C's, what if B default and C says, I won't pay you. So then A is in trouble. B again, false sense of security because what if C, false sense of security was C or A both because what if C doesn't realize that B is going to default very soon or for A that if B defaults, A will C will also default. So there is risk for A as well that way. And A might take excessive risks. So C will stop getting that 2% also. There are many things possible here. So these are the advantages and disadvantages of CDS. It's very simple. It's just an insurance on a loan or a debt obligation. The next is collateralized debt obligations. So to understand that, let's draw something. So a bank gives out loans to bank, gives out loans to 100 people worth 100 million. 100 people. Now the bank has given out these loans. The bank holds these loans on its uh, asset side. And until these loans mature, do you think the bank will sit and sleep? The bank won't do anything? No, that is not the case. The bank, let's say, has given out the loans at 5%. So what the bank does is that the bank sells off these loans or a part of these, a large chunk, to a special purpose vehicle that it creates, an entity that it creates. Usually the bank itself creates a separate entity the bank sells them off for a discount. Let's say the bank gives the 100 million of loan to them and the bank takes back 97 million. So the 3 million, the SPV earns in fees, which it will require to run and uh, 
recover these loans and it takes on credit risk as well so the bank got 97 million now so the bank will give 97 million worth or bank will pay off its expenses and let's say give off 95 million of loans again again it will sell it off for 92 million then we give another loan of 90 million so this is a never ending structure and what happens now is that let's say the spv now it has 100 million of loans so against these 100 million of loans the spv issues a bond which is called a collateralized debt obligation collateralized means it is collateralized by these loans 100 million worth of loans which are usually mortgage loans and uh, before 2007 and people usually thought that property prices will keep rising and mortgages will keep paying uh, mortgage owners will keep paying back the interest so they issue a bond called cdo collateralized debt obligation and people pay them 100 million for that you which using which they fund this purchase simple and what happens is that people now pay the interest the 100 million of loan which has been given people pay interest let's say 5% to the spv or to, to the bank and goes to the spv obviously the spv owns the loans now and the spv gives the cdo holders an interest rate of 3% so the spv in turn has a 2% margin is all example explanatory this is not actual figures so this is what a collateralized debt obligation is that it is collateralized by these 100 million worth of loans and it is a debt obligation that the spv will have to return this 100 million on expiry of on uh, maturity of the bond simple the spv is earning 2% but what where this price is stemmed from was that now the bank doesn't care because the bank is getting money from people from the common public it is taking money through the spv giving out useless loans to it gives out loans to anyone you go and you take a loan for 0.1% 1% anything you fail to pay the loan bank doesn't care now only the spv cares and who who is funding the spv common people so it's separate from the bank as well so the bank actually doesn't care but in reality the spv is a part of the bank only and this has been cemented by laws that have come up more stringent laws to control this and this cdo is what caused the 2007-9 crisis the 30 year bonds like i told you in liquidity risk the lehman brothers invested a lot in these 30 year cdos thinking that this 3% will be eternal and when the value of these cdos started falling because their risk increased lehman brothers got wiped out the next is the collateralized debt obligation uh, mortgage obligation so there are different kinds of debt when it is only backed by mort- home loan mort- mortgages it's called a collateralized mortgage obligation then there is a product called cdo squared branches of cdos and there are uh, a lot of convoluted structures so let's say this spv got 100 million worth of loan out of that 30 people are from a category like i explained the credit worthiness i'm just giving you a category name actually it's not named like this there are different notations for this there is different nomenclature taxonomy so 30 a 40 b uh 25 c and 5 d category so now when the spv gets this what it does is that when the spv gets five such different pools of 100 million so 500 million so what it does is that it takes all the five sorry fifth grade a together it it takes all the five grade b together it takes all the five grade c together it takes all five and it makes a convoluted structure and what happened was that you won't believe it five c category loans they were put together and the cdo of that was given an a rating and which is why the system failed which is exactly why the system failed because the credit rating agencies rated the cdo a which was backed by shit subprime mortgages so let's move on to the advantages of cdo i have not covered the structure uh, exactly like i should have per se but i'll do that in subsequent modules if you come up again so the advantages of cdo is that increased profit potential obviously the bank is uh, can keep giving out loans bank can keep giving out loans now 
the second one is direct risk risk transfer the bank is effectively transferring the risk the bank thinks so but spv is actually owned by under the bank itself under the uh, aspect of the bank itself third one is loan access increases so now the bank since the bank can give out loans to many people so the bank can give out so many loans is giving out loan to many people and loan access increasing interest rates are going down the disadvantage is that encourages increased risk taking like i said the bank was giving out loans to any and everyone second is risk concentration potential <coughs> that the bank is giving out huge loans to high risk borrowers who might not pay third is high complexity like i said convoluted structure tranches etc five c grade uh, loan tools became a grade cdo so there those are the disadvantages next is collateralized loan obligation this is a cdo only but uh, the packages of loans rather than mortgages bank loans which have gone through an underwriting process and clos have uh, technically survived the 2007 crisis which is mentioned here so let's move on to the traditional approaches of <coughs> uh, mitigating credit risk first is insurance you take a pool of loans and you take an insurance of that simple the second is exposure netting so let me explain this to you let's say a a bank and b a has to give b 20 and he has to take 10 from b okay all right so what happens is that if b defaults right now a will still have to give the whole 20 and b will give out only the loss given default of let's say 50% which is 5 so net a has a is giving b 15 net a gives b 15 Will be 15 in the first case, right? But however, if I net the exposures, that is, <clears throat> A had to give 20 and B had to give 10, right? So what if I say no? A B has to give zero. I'll give him 10. Even if B defaults, I am not at risk. I have net my exposure. I am only giving him 10. Otherwise, I would have I have to give 15 net. so that is how netting is helpful <clears throat> second third one is marking to market so uh, what happens in credit derivatives is that you need to even if there is no transaction you need to keep marking the value to the market let's say uh, i i bet against you uh, that uh, that the stock price of the stock will fall but it keeps rising 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 uh, let's say after two days the the price was 100 and after two days the price became 105 so now you want me to give you 5 for now just to ba- balance of the account just to square the account off so that you are not at a high uh, level of risk later on for example let's say if the price goes up to 150 i will say no i will not pay anything then you have a uh, huge settlement risk but if after every 5 dollars you tell me now you have to pay 5 dollars now you have to pay 5 dollars then you are not at a risk number 4 is requiring collateral which is very simple the bank asks you to uh give any asset valuable asset that you have as collateral against your loans and if you can't pay a bank will seize that asset the fifth is termination clause which is that it uh, says that if your credit worthiness decreases if the rating agency downgrades you then and there this uh, contract ceases to exist you have to pay me back my money anyhow <coughs> Number six is reassignment. Again, in case there is a trigger or a downgrade, the bank can auto automatically transfer the risk to a third party. For example, automatically again there is a provision of a clause which will transfer the risk to a third party through an insurance contract or uh, a loan to someone else. Your loan is transferred to another party, etc. A guarantor. Lastly, there is a process called syndication, which is that a bank cannot, let's say, give out. a loan individually worth a billion to one person which is it it would be a huge risk for the bank so five seven banks come together someone pay one bank pays 100 million one two and one three hundred and they all together make up one billion and give a loan to an organization that's how syndication works syndicate banks form a syndicate the role of the credit derivatives in the financial crisis like i explained earlier uh, similarly this entire part talks about that that banks give out loans to very risky high risky people it was called ninja loans no income no job 
ninja loan and because the bank didn't care it was just an originate to distribute model which is given over here the bank just needs to give the loan and then they have to sell that asset to the spv and they earn the spread whatever it is so, so the bank doesn't care at all whatever they do with that money so they can give out loans to anyone and anyone and this again this uh, these bad loans would be subprime loans would be repackaged into a cdo with convoluted structures again and then they will be given out to consumers ordinary people and this caused basically the the derivative crisis it says that the cds market ballooned to 45 trillion in notional value which was huge it was larger than the amount in us equity treasury and mortgages combined because there was a huge amount of leverages in these it grew because investors were buying cdss against assets they did not own so they were trying to profit for example what did i tell you that uh, i have taken a bond from uh, an entity or i have given a loan to that entity and so i will take a cds on them but that is not the case people were taking cds just like that because uh, let's see uh, what if the fall, what if they fall then i'll earn that entire amount as profit rather than as a hedging instrument and this just talks about the crisis as a whole i will there is a whole chapter on whole reading on uh, the 2079 crisis well I, i'll explain everything properly securitization and special special purpose vehicles so this is again that the loan pools were securitized into a, a by a special purpose vehicle into a collateralized debt obligation this is just the history Freddie Mac, Chrysler issued, ABS issued, CLO issued. Buy and hold strategy originate to distribute, like I told you, originate to distribute. The bank just give out the loan and then sells the loan pool to the SPV. Bank doesn't care. So the advantages of the OTD model include bank profitability. Obviously, since they can uh, distribute the loans away and give, keep giving out loans, they will earn higher profits. The risk management uh, is that the risk is distributed to different special purpose vehicles. and if uh, the vehicles are distributing it to the investors of the cdos then the investor options are increasing because they had access to a wider range of cdo clo cmos abs etc then there is loan access uh, people can take more loans now from the banks and then we move to the disadvantages which is very important moral hazard obviously i won't care uh, because i just need to give the loan and then sell that loan pool away so i don't care who i give it to moral hazard Missile incentive again, short-term profitability rather than long-term sustainability. Opaqueness because the investors of the CDOs did not know the inherent risk in those products, so there was it was opaque. It was not transparent, and this structured uh, system uh, caused the demise of uh, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and it caused the global financial crisis of 2007-9.